Hi there, and welcome to Gimme2. My name is Mark, and in this video, we're going to talk about the solar system in just two minutes. Now, as always, if you are interested in going straight to the layout and the architecture of the solar system, that is timestamped in the description. But if you stick around for a couple of minutes, I do go through some context like how the solar system came to be, and I talk about some cosmic distances. Just to clarify what I mean by the solar system, there are several different boundaries, and for the sake of this video, I am going to talk about the outermost edge of the Sun's discernible gravitational influence. Other edges could include the end of the inner solar system with our final large body or planet called Neptune, or the end of the Sun's magnetic field called the heliosphere. Let's talk about how we got here by discussing the nebular hypothesis, which is the most widely accepted theory of star system formation. A long time ago, in a galaxy far... Actually, no. In the galaxy where we live, in the Milky Way galaxy, a nebula existed. Now, nebulae are spinning clouds of space gas and dust. With time, and possibly the nudge from a supernova, which is the explosive death of a star, gravity begins to collapse the nebula, pulling in gas and dust and creating a dense core called a protostar. This dense core speeds up the rotation of the nebula and flattens the dust and the gas into something called an accretion disk. When dense or hot enough, these protostars will begin fusing light elements, at which point it will be a star. The material in the accretion disk that surrounds this star will collide, creating its own formidable bodies. The largest of these, called planets, even develop their own gravitational poles, attracting orbiters called satellites. Our satellite is called the Moon. Smaller orbiting objects within the accretion disk include, but are not limited to, asteroids, comets, dwarf planets, we miss you Pluto, as well as some smaller dust and rock which may enter into the Earth's atmosphere as meteors, or as we call them, shooting stars. The motion of all this material is trying to push it out into space, but is simultaneously being pulled back by the gravity of the star, preventing it from venturing out too far. The combination of that motion and the star's gravity is called centripetal force and results in a circular motion or orbit around that star. Anything within the star's gravitational pull is part of the star system, and when the Latin name for that star is Sol, it is called the Solar System. Solar System. Just as a reference for distances, the solar system, while huge from a human perspective, is tiny on a cosmic scale. Cosmic distances are generally measured by light years, which is the amount of distance that light will travel in one year, and light travels at about 186,000 miles per second. The Milky Way, our galaxy, is approximately 100,000 light years across. Our solar system, by contrast, is maybe one and a half light years, and only about five light hours from the sun till the farthest planet. So yeah, tiny on a cosmic scale. For a more palatable measurement, our solar system is measured by astronomical units, AUs, with each unit representing the distance between the sun and the earth, which is approximately 93 million miles. I know these numbers are huge and difficult to grasp, but that's just how large space is. Now that we have an understanding of how we got here and how large things can be, let's get to the actual layout of the solar system. So let's get the clock started now. The center of the solar system is the Sun, an 865,000 mile diameter ball of hydrogen and helium that contains over 99% of the solar system's mass. The inner solar system is broken up into two subsections, the terrestrial planets and the Jovian planets. Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars make up the smaller and the solid terrestrial planets. Jupiter and Saturn, the gas giants, and Uranus and Neptune, the ice giants, make up the larger Jovians with no solid surfaces. Also in the inner solar system are asteroids, rocky objects ranging from several meters to hundreds of kilometers that aren't large enough to be dwarf planets. A large majority of these are found in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, dividing the terrestrial and the Jovian planets. However, there are also near-Earth asteroids with orbits closer to home, as well as Trojans which follow the orbits of other planets, mostly Jupiter. 
centaurs, which have both asteroid and comet properties, cross the orbits of the Jovian planets. Beyond Neptune lies the outer solar system, beginning with the Kuiper Belt and the more vast Scattered Disk. Beginning at roughly 30 AU with the Kuiper Belt, these disks contain icy space material. It's estimated that the dwarf planets, comets, which are frozen asteroids that glow and burn up when they get close to the sun, and other icy particles in these disks combine to less than the Earth's mass. At the farthest expanses of the solar system, well past the Kuiper Belt and the Scatter Disk, lies the spherical, as opposed to mostly flat like the rest of the solar system, Oort Cloud. While not directly observed, this cloud of icy objects could extend as far as 100,000 AUs, compared to the Kuiper Belt's 50 AUs, and contains the farthest objects that are still bound to the sun's gravity. Once you pass the Oort Cloud, you're out of the solar system. I had a lot of fun researching material for this video, as I do with most of these topics, and I hope you enjoyed watching it. If you did, please consider liking, subscribing, commenting, all those good things, and I hope to see you in another video. Thanks for watching.